Hey there students, Tom Ritchie here for a bit of AP US History Review. Uh, tonight's session is going to focus on um, period three, unit three, the so-called unit three, um, going from the French and Indian War 1754 to the revolution of 1800, the election of Jefferson. Um, so as far as that goes, that the questions from that uh, period are going to be fair game. Okay. So, you know, just let me, uh, let me throw something up here. Uh, so questions about period three or the unit three or whatever we're going to call this. Okay. So going from there, I want to first tell you about while we're here, we're going to be doing free broadcast every week between now and the exam. But remember that Marco Learning is offering student support, not just for AP US history, but for eight different subjects. Okay. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Odds are, you're taking at least one of these other ones. So if you go to marcolearning.com slash student dash support, you will be able to see uh, more information about that. So the U.S. History um, Student Support course actually is starting on Wednesday of this week. Looks like all of these are 8 to 9.30. Okay, so 8 o'clock to 9.30 p.m. Eastern. And so these are going to be live, but you can watch them later. And these are going to be, you know, small group, more focused sessions. Uh, so so with that, uh, go ahead and keep that in mind. I'll go ahead and put something in the chat here. Now, also another thing that I'll show y'all is that last year, now of course, uh, you know the College Board is not uh, officially allowing cheating on this year's exam. I don't mean to advocate any kind of cheating, but this is something that I designed here as a cheat sheet for Unit 3, Period 3 or whatever. And this is just something that can be good to help you study. I've gone through the main things here from the French and Indian War, the American Revolution um, going into the Articles of Confederation and the Articles versus the Constitution, Federalist versus Anti-Federalist. Okay, so looking at what we've got going on here, Washington's foreign policy and the Adams administration. So I'm going to put a couple of links in the in the chat here, but if you just search for a push unit three cheat sheet, you'll run into that. Now remember, for Marco Learning student support, go to marcolearning.com slash student dash support. So we'll go ahead and go with that. Now, remember, those of you in the Crowdcast, now if you're on YouTube, I would encourage you to join our Crowdcast. That's an ongoing review session that we've got here. Okay, so this is something, um, student support, and then if you want to get the so-called cheat sheet for Unit 3 for the 2020 exam, that's available on my website. So let's go ahead and get into our questions. Okay, so what would I say are the largest causes and impacts of the French and Indian War. Now, I have a video, the French and Indian War as a turning point, okay? Now, that's something that is available on YouTube, but let's go ahead and note that because that's really the beginning of Unit 3, okay? So, I'm going to go ahead and put some slides up here, and let's go through a quick version of this together. Now, keep in mind that I do have a full version of this on YouTube. So, if you just go ahead and type in Richie French and Indian War or French and Indian Indian War as a turning point, you'll see this here, okay? So going into this, the French and Indian War is a turning point, okay? And so remember that the purpose of a colony is to make a profit for the mother country, okay? So that's something that we're seeing before the French and Indian War. We see that Parliament passes the Navigation Acts. Now we want to note here that it's not just about name dropping on this exam. You want to be able to take the Navigation Acts and you want to associate it with the idea of mercantilism. Now, mercantilism describes a certain type of trade policy, okay? So they're designed to discourage trade with other nations and give preference to British ports. So mercantilism is about discouraging trade, giving preference to British ports. So remember, Britain has not only the North American colonies, but also sugar colonies in the Caribbean. And remember that all of the colonies are supposed to be providing the mother country with raw materials to use for manufacturing. Now, the while we want to associate the Navigation Acts with mercantilism, we also want to note here that the Navigation Acts did not tend to be strictly enforced. And this is something known as salutary neglect. Now, when we're thinking about salutary neglect, we want to think in in, in terms of just neglect, if I say, oh my goodness, I neglected to study for my eight push exam. Now, that's bad neglect or my goodness, I, 
I didn't mean to leave my four-year-old at home for two days alone. That never happened, by the way, okay? I never left my kid at home uh, when she was four. Now, the thing is, now she is 11. Once she is 16, nobody's going to think, okay, that is neglect if you left your 16 year old at home for a couple of days with some money to uh you know to buy food and then you know don't have any parties right that sort of thing that most of you you know you're about the age of 16 right now most of you taking the a push exam you would probably be thankful if your parents left you at home. Now, the thing is that a lot of your parents probably won't because, you know, although you are the most trustworthy people who have ever existed, they probably just don't want their house messed up by all your friends coming over when they're not home. So salutary neglect is good neglect. Salutary. We are saluting by neglecting you. And so there is a point where you actually want to be neglected. So what's going on here is although the navigation acts are on the on the books, then they are not strongly enforced. And so although mercantilism is the official policy um, of the British government before the French and Indian War, it is not enforced until afterward. Okay. And so trade is a top economic priority. And if you want to encourage trade, then you have as few regulations as possible. Now, the other thing is that there was a limited troop presence uh, in the North American colonies. There weren't many British troops. Now, as far as the causes of the French and Indian War, what we've got here is New France. In blue, we've got New France. Now, the French claimed a lot of land going from Canada to uh, Louise, to present-day Louisiana all along the Mississippi River. Now, first of all, you notice how the British have claims up here in Canada. The French uh, claims are here in the middle of British claims here, British claims here. Now, also, the French are claiming the extremely fertile Ohio Ohio River Valley. And so this Ohio River Valley is something that is extremely fertile land here. And the, the French are claiming it, but they didn't really put people on it. And so British settlers are crossing the Appalachian Mountains and they are settling in this Ohio River Valley. And of course, the French start bringing forward troops to, uh, you know, and putting them around Pit to present day Pittsburgh um, in order to uh, defend their claims to the land. So this is really what what happens uh, along this, uh, you know, this Anglo-Franco border here is going to be where we see the opening shots of the French and Indian War. Uh, George Washington comes onto the scene. It does not end up being his greatest shining moment over at Fort Necessity. So as far as that goes, you want to know Really, I would say that the consequences of the French and Indian War are the most important. So as far as that goes, you want to know the context. What were things like before the French and Indian War? And France is claiming this land here. Now, so as far as that goes, before the French and Indian War, the British government trying to promote trade, they're not enforcing the Navigation Acts. Salutary neglect. There's not a great British troop presence there. And so what did the war change? Now, first of all, the war increased Britain's debt a great deal. We don't need to know exactly how much debt or anything like that, but know that it went up a great deal. And so the British come here after the French and Indian War. And, and these conclusions are not without merit. Now, as, as Americans, like, oh, the British, or, you know, whatever. Um, but then again, what the British conclude is, first of all, the colonies were unable to effectively respond to the French threat on their own. Now, if you're wanting uh, to look at these slides, uh, the YouTube video, you can put that on pause. Second, British military intervention in North America was expensive, resulting in massive debt. So, British troops should be permanently stationed in North America and the colonists should pay for their upkeep because the colonists were not able to find this, uh, you know, and able to fight this war by themselves without British help, which is kind of the truth. Uh, so with this, so don't tell America I said that, by the way. So salutary neglect, okay, is gone. So now there's going to be no more of this salutary neglect. The British want to control trade in the colonies. So first of all, British troops, okay? When I think about this, I'm thinking about troops, taxes, trade, tyranny. If we're wanting the causes of the American Revolution, we can kind of sum that, you know, actually we could put a fifth, tradition, okay? Troops 
taxes, trade, tyranny, and tradition. These are things that are going to be spurring the American Revolution. And so we see the British troops show up. Now, also strict enforcement of the Navigation Acts. No more of the salutary neglect. And revenue becomes top priority, so they increase taxes. So afterwards, the Navigation Acts are enforced, salutary neglect is gone, and we see more British troops. Now, more British troops when they're no longer necessary, because one of the consequences of the French and Indian War is that the French gave up all of their North American colonies. And Britain and Spain basically split North America along the Mississippi River. Uh, Spain actually even gave uh, Florida to Britain, which uh, they got it back after the American Revolution because Spain, along with France, helped us. So with that, we want to keep in mind here that uh, that we see that the British really, there's no need for a troop presence here other than the British want to maintain a standing army and their own subjects in Britain don't want to pay for it. So when we're thinking about immediate consequences, okay, the immediate consequence of the French and Indian War is that there was tension between colonists and the British government over taxation, troops, trade. Okay. Now, again, if you want to add tyranny and tradition to that, then you can, uh, you know, you can see some things there, but I would say the big three for the American revolution, taxation, troops, trade. And then we see here that, you know, why do we still need the British? Okay. Why do we need them to protect us when there are no more French? And so 1763 to 1776, this is that 13 year period between the end of the French and Indian war and the declaration of independence. So, so we can see here the long-term consequence. Now, not so long-term, but long-term consequence. The French and Indian War did not immediately result in American independence from Britain, but over the long term, it did result in American independence from Britain. So with that, uh, let me go ahead. Yeah, so great. Uh, CVD College Board Dayhan is over here with us. And so with that, do we need to memorize all of this stuff here? Okay, so Joe, I would say here that the Sugar Act, the Stamp Act, the Townsend Acts, okay, you've got these three taxes in the 1760s. Most important is the Stamp Act. So I would say here that you don't, you're not going going to be able to become an expert on everything. Now, maybe CBD can, okay? Maybe, maybe she can, but most people are not going to be able to become an expert on everything. So I would pick a few things that you can use as examples in your SAQ, remember specific answer question, DBQ or LEQ, okay? So, so with that, you know, it's not about memorizing it, but learning about it. So think about this. I would encourage you to think of three significant events that are going into the American Revolution. The Stamp Act, I would say, is one of them that is a need to know. The Intolerable Acts, need to know. Lexington and Concord, need to know. Now, beyond that, I would say that you get, and of course, with the Intolerable Acts, I also mean in terms of the, uh, you know, of the Boston Tea Party and all of that. Okay, so you want to make sure that you've got, uh, that you've got that. Let's see, Intolerable Acts. Let me just uh, let me just look at this real quick here and see if I've got this. Yeah. So let's see. Um, OK, actually, I don't have that posted yet, but I've got something on the intolerable acts that I need to post. Now, I would say the intolerable acts like, you know, you've got five different intolerable acts. Uh, you know, let me actually go into my Google Drive. I do need to post this. The problem is there are a lot of things that I'll put on Google Drive that I just don't end up actually putting on my website. I've got to get better about this. OK, so let's go ahead and look at. OK, so the intolerable acts, I'm going to go ahead and make a make a link here so that those of y'all who are with me um, can see this. Y'all can access it. I do need to put this on my website so you can view it. I'm going to go ahead and copy this. All right. So with that, let me just run in here and um, paste this into the Crowdcast chat. If you're if you're with us on YouTube, go ahead and click the link to join our course in Crowdcast. OK, so as far as that, uh, as far as that goes. 
okay, and Miss Skinner's here. If there are any teachers, feel free to print this, okay, feel free to print this out. But this is something I've got here on the Intolerable Act. So you're not going to be able to become an expert on everything, but you could become an expert on the Stamp Act and the Intolerable Acts. And so, yeah, some of y'all, okay, so it looks like some of y'all are here with me. And so, first of all, we're giving some historical context. So, part of um, you know, knowing the intolerable acts is not just knowing all five things here. Now, I would say if you only knew two of these, okay? So if you remembered the Boston Port Act, remember not just what it's called, but also what it did, that it closed the port of Boston. Boston being one of the busiest ports in uh, British North America at the time. So it killed the economy of Massachusetts. So then the Massachusetts Government Act that basically put Massachusetts under martial law. Now, teachers, y'all feel free to link to this, you know, students, share it with your friends. Uh, that's fine because I need to put this on my website. But here are the five intolerable acts or four plus one because the Quebec Act was kind of guilty by association. Um, so with that, you don't necessarily need to know all of these, but the more of these you know, the better you're going to do uh, as far as being able to put examples out there. But let's say that you know these two. And then you also know some context. Now, note here that the historical context of the Intolerable Act is important because you had the Tea Act. I'm explaining what the Tea Act is. It granted a monopoly. Remember, the Tea Act was not a tax, okay? That's something really important to note there that the Tea Act was not a tax. And so that is uh, that is very important uh, to keep in mind there um, that it was a monopoly. OK, the T Act was a monopoly and it's something that colonists resented because the point of the T Act was to try to crack down on smuggling. OK, so they wanted to, uh, you know, to basically give uh, the British East India Company the best rates, like to be able to import tea without paying any internal taxes. So it brought their tea price down to the price of smuggled tea and colonists resented that. Remember, one of the biggest smugglers uh, that was uh, that was in British North America at that time in the 13 colonies was John Hancock, whose um, who's literal John Hancock, his signature is right there in the middle of the Declaration of Independence. So it's a monopoly here. And so this is one of those things that the Townsend Acts were kind of left over, but this wasn't the the Tea Act was not a tax. So it resulted in the Boston Tea Party doing damages that amounted to you know, today, $1.7 million, okay? And so as far as that goes, the destruction of the tea um, by the Sons of Liberty has been referred to as the Boston Tea Party. Um, so with this, you know, we're seeing the passage of the Intolerable Acts. Now also knowing what they were really called, their official name being the Coercive Acts, okay? And they were designed to punish the colonists. Um, and so the colonists called them the Intolerable Acts. Like keep in mind POV analysis, uh, you know, Parliament is not uh, calling it like we're passing the Intolerable Acts. So knowing some historical context there, just like for the Stamp Act, a lot of your historical context is the Magna Carta. Okay, so as far as that, uh, you know, as far as that goes, uh, the Magna Carta, which was passed in 12, you know, which was signed by King John in 1215, where he agreed that taxation would only be levied by consent of elected representatives. And of course, representatives of the church and the nobility. And so there's this idea that the, you know, when you think about the Stamp Act, it was an internal tax. And, uh, you know, the colonists believe that we have a right to consent to taxation because we're not represented in parliament. We have a right to consent to taxation through our colonial legislatures. So when we say these things, we're not talking about, quote unquote, memorizing the intolerable acts. OK, so with that, the intolerable acts united groups of colonists from several colonies to work together. Remember the effects. So what caused the intolerable acts and what were the effects? And so the Intolerable Acts united groups of colonists to work together. And so 12 colonies sent delegates to the First Continental Congress. Before this time, remember the Albany Plan of Union. Now, one of the things here is 
uh, when we think about this join or die cartoon, this was drawn by Benjamin Franklin, published in his newspaper. I don't know if he personally drew it, but let's just say that he did, right? Um, it was published by Benjamin Franklin. And so with this, uh, you know, when we see here, join or die. Now, the context of this is the French and Indian War. So we want to notice here that a lot of people mix this up with the revolution, but Ben Franklin published this, uh, you know, join or die. The Albany Plan of Union was proposed during the French and Indian War, and the colonies rejected it. We don't want to work together. We don't want to work with them. Okay. And so this is so important here, seeing that the intolerable acts really put the colonies working together for, you know, in close proximity with each other, other colonies consciously sending aid to Massachusetts, South Carolina, for example, sending a, uh, you know, a ship full of rice. Okay. They had rice. They're like, you know what, let's send this to Massachusetts for relief. So it is getting the colonies needs to work together. And that's why this is such a landmark. So note, the First Continental Congress is called in response. Okay. So it's called in response to the, you know, the First Continental Congress called in response to the Intolerable Act. So that's what that's about. It would be better to become an expert in three things leading up to the American Revolution than to know the names of everything on a timeline. So, you know, some things you'll want to know that they happen. Sugar, you know, the Sugar Act is pretty easy, right? It's an import tax on sugar. The Stamp Act and the Townsend Acts, those are your three things, uh, your three taxes in the 1760s. As we know, this really kind of goes from a tax revolt. The American Revolution starts as a tax revolt that is not not advocating independence to a full-scale independence movement. And I believe that the intolerable acts are really what transitions what used to be a revolt against taxes and troops. And we see that it's turning into a revolutionary movement. Okay. So as far as that, uh, as far as that goes that we've got here now, as far as that goes, we don't want to go too much into, when we start trying to gain the exam, I'm at being asked, what are common DBQ topics for period three? I would not <coughs> approach the exam that way. I would answer the question the best I can. So when you get a question, um, you're going to approach this. So for example, I've got a few DBQs uh, that I've written myself. Now y'all uh, stay on the lookout. I plan to have some weekend writing sessions that are going to be premium sessions. I'll let y'all know when those are offered. I'm going to be sending out emails to people who are subscribed to Crowdcast. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to navigate those. But when you get a question, so evaluate the extent to which the United States Constitution resulted in political change in the United States. Well, what we're getting here is, okay, we're comparing the Articles of Confederation, the Constitution, and seeing how is it that the, to what extent did the Constitution change um, what was going on with the government of the United States? And to what extent was it continuity? To what extent was it discontinuity? So with the DBQ, it's not so much anticipating the topic as having the skill set and knowing, okay, I've got this question here. I've got these documents and I know outside evidence from the period. It's really much more skill based than like the odds of you anticipating a DBQ topic almost zero. Okay. So keep that in mind. Uh, you want to know how to write a DBQ. That's very important. So again, I'm being asked again, what are the most common LEQ topics? Um, the thing is, know things, understand what's going on between the French and Indian War and Jefferson's election, and you're going to be equipped for what they throw at you. The main thing here, we're thinking about causation and the American Revolution. OK, what are the causes of the American Revolution? What are the effects? OK, this is important as well. If we think about the effects or the legacies of the French of, of the American Revolution. Sorry, I was just you doing a Euro broadcast. Um, so the American Revolution happened. Don't try to anticipate a DDQ or 
an LEQ topic as much as think about, okay, what caused the American Revolution? What effects did it have? Okay, so when we're thinking about effects of the American Revolution, what difference did it make? Okay, and so was it simply, and this is a historical judgment, was it simply a political revolution that resulted in a change in government or did it result in meaningful changes in American society? Either you believe that it was mostly political with very few changes. Now, remember, you'll never answer it 100% um, either or 0%. Now, also stay out of the so-called no man's land. Don't do a 50-50, okay? So think about it more political or it did result in some meaningful changes. And so one thing I always like to point out, the American Revolution certainly wasn't as radical as, you know, didn't result in as radical of changes as the French Revolution. Um, in fact, you know, it was largely a defense of traditional British liberties, um, such as taxation by consent. And so, but the thing is though, look at Jefferson in 1786, um, immediately after the, you know, after the, why do I keep saying? French Revolution, um, immediately after the American Revolution. And then we see Jefferson only five years later in 1791. That Jefferson, of course, he's in Britain here, but he's in, in the U.S. But at the same time, I think it's important to note that Jefferson sat for this portrait. Five years later, he sat for this one. And so we see here that Jefferson is much more intent on portraying himself as a simple man. We see that uh, these powdered wigs are going out of style. We want to see more Republican simplicity. So when we think about Republicanism, now it's not the Republican Party, it's the idea of a Republican form of government. And so with that, uh, you know, egalitarianism. So we're moving from monarchy where there is a fixed social hierarchy. I was actually in Pakistan during spring break, a very, very interesting country, very different than ours. Uh, you know, it's it's a country where they still have uh, very fixed, you know, not as fixed as you'd imagine, but certainly there's more of an emphasis on social hierarchy there um, than there is in the United States. You know, the only difference really in the United States is how much money do you have? Okay. That's what differentiates you from other people. But, uh, you know, in Pakistan and in other countries in Asia, there's still an emphasis on, you know, these people are higher up in society than these people. And so in this situation, you know, this fixed social hierarchy, also in Pakistan, um, gender roles are much more entrenched uh, than they are than they are here, um, that there is a lot more separation between men and women. For example, when I was at uh, the airport this morning, I was at LaGuardia about to catch my flight home. And there was uh, there there was a, you know, a male and a female co-worker that I guess like TSA co-worker that had seen each other in a long time and suddenly they're you know they're working in the same place she came up and gave the guy a hug you don't see that in Pakistan and so you know the thing is that there are some things about the United States where we have this like e more egalitarian kind of society and this is something that is a product of over 200 years of republicanism now was the egalitarianism instant? Do we see instant equality between men and women? Do we see instant, uh, you know, abolition of classes and stuff? You know, slavery, for example. I mean, this is something that, you know, is going to, it's going to take some time. But for example, when we look at the United States Constitution, no title of nobility shall be granted by the United States. And so that's something that differentiates the United States from Britain. So no, uh, you know, Southern states that had primogeniture laws, like that said that the oldest will inherit, they're repealing those laws, which had often been in disuse anyway, but they are formally taking them off the books. Now note that slavery is a mixed bag here because Northern states, now this is a map of free states by 1800. By 1800, almost every state north of the Mason-Dixon line had passed gradual emancipation laws. Now, on the other side of this, okay, what we want to note here is, first of all, gradual emancipation laws. Now, we don't want to confuse that with racial equality. Few northern states allowed free black residents to vote. Um, some of the states actually 
uh, you know, banned black Americans from living in the state. Now they may or may not enforce it, but even if it's not enforced, um, it sends a message that you are not equal and you should be on your best behavior lest we kick you out of the state. Um, so as far as that goes, we don't want to mistake the gradual emancipation laws with racial equality in the North. So as far as that goes, the effective end of slavery in a lot of these Northern states was in the 18th 1940s, which you note uh, co coincides with uh, anti-slavery movements in the United States gaining a lot of steam in this 1840s antebellum period. Now, on the other side, we want to note that slavery becomes even more entrenched in the South. And so with that, and in fact, a lot of these Northern slaveholders, uh, when their states are passing gradual emancipation laws, they are not freeing their slaves, but they're selling their slaves down South. Um, and so with that, we see a mixed legacy regarding slavery. Um, and then when it comes to religious freedom, all right, before the American Revolution, you have established churches in nearly all of the colonies. Now, remember, Pennsylvania is an exception here, founded by the Quakers. But Jefferson wrote the, the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, which disestablished the Anglican Church in Virginia. And a lot of states followed suit. By 1800, I believe only Connecticut and Massachusetts still had a state church. And so with that, uh, you know, we want to notice here, again, federalism that because the American Revolution, you have these colonies that are protesting tyranny in, uh, you know, by the mother country, you can see where uh, that the that the states work together to get their independence from Britain, but they still kept their separate identities because they didn't want to be tyrannized by a federal government. Now, of course, that is part of the opposition by the anti-federalists to the Constitution. And so federalism, that the states are like, no, we, we don't want another government calling the shots here. And so with that, that federalism is very important there. When we think about the effect the American Revolution had on women, Abigail Adams wrote to her husband, remember the ladies, right? That don't forget that women are in this country too. Now note here that women do not get the right to vote, okay? That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen for more than a century. So going from there, we also want to note property ownership, okay? So the American Revolution did not result in an increase in property rights for, for married women. Um, that basically she could retain some control over her real property. So for example, if there was land that came into the marriage, uh, the husband would not have an unlimited right to sell the land because that's something that's supposed to be held for the children. So a woman would retain some control of real property she brought in the marriage, real estate. But as far as personal property, her husband express, you know, ex exercises complete control. And so then with Republican motherhood, now we want to note Republican motherhood. Now, again, that's not the Republican Party. Uh, I need to update this. Uh, Sarah Palin's been out of politics for a little while. But small r Republicanism, um, this idea that strong families make a strong republic and um, that women have a meaningful role to play in raising their sons to be good citizens and good educated people. Um, Jefferson wrote, uh, if a nation expects to be ignorant and free, it, it expects what never was and never will be. Um, and then we get into agrarianism, you know, this idea that, you know, Jefferson um, is you know, huge advocate of agrarianism and this idea that, you know, we should continue um, to be a nation of farmers. It makes us different uh, than Europe. Those who labor in the earth are the chosen people of God. Um, so with that, we see Republican simplicity. Like this is something I always note here. If you've been to the Lincoln Memorial versus the Jefferson Memorial, Jefferson here is just standing up. He is unadorned and pretty simple there. There's Washington. Uh, when he got sculpted, he was like, you know, just let me have my belly. OK, he's being sculpted not as an ideal person, but as a farmer um, on this iconic statue of George Washington, who also designed a 16 sided barn. Very impressive. If you ever go to Mount Vernon, by the way, um, that Washington here, he has a plow behind him. So he's glorifying 
agriculture, okay, that uh, later on there's a statue that somebody makes here that the American public, this was not very popular because Americans don't look at their, uh, you know, at their leaders as gods. They look at their leaders as people who are serving in a position of public trust. And Washington, just like the ancient Roman Cincinnatus, Washington embraced this principle of rotation in office, that after someone serves, they should go ahead and give up their position. And so that's something here that, you know, we think about the legacies of the French Revolution. We want to, uh, French again, okay, American Revolution. Um, so with that, you know, this is something that when you're thinking about that, think about causes and effects. Think about any of these things that, you know, comparison, the articles versus the Constitution, uh, the Jeffersonian slash Democratic, whatever you want to call them, Republicans, and, uh, you know, Hamilton's Federalist. Um, so we see here who wanted American involvement. Now we get something about the French Revolution. OK, so uh, the thing is that nobody what we want to note here, the controversy over American neutrality and the French Revolution. Revolution. It wasn't that Jefferson and Madison wanted to send American troops and be actively involved, but Jefferson did not want to formally declare neutrality. Jefferson wanted to support the French Revolution in spirit, whereas Hamilton wanted it condemned. OK, now Washington says, you know what, we're just going to proclaim our neutrality. Jefferson was not a big fan of the neutrality policy as secretary of state, but as president, Jefferson continued the neutrality policy, which became really a hallmark of American foreign policy all the way until World War II. So going, uh, going from there, um, let's see, recall if the two of them, yeah, join or die, I would not associate that with the, uh, you know, with the Sons of Liberty. I would not associate join or die with the Sons of Liberty. Uh, this is something you want to associate with Benjamin Franklin. So with that, um, you know, would it be safe to say, um, okay, John, this, yeah. So what I would say here is that I would not expect, especially not on the paper pencil. Now, this is just a prediction, especially not on the paper pencil test um, in early May. I would not expect anything like World War II or later. I, I would think that we're going to see something on that paper pencil, um, something probably World War One, 1920s or earlier. Um, so that's just my guess. Now, of course, you don't remember that they say the exam is going to be a full exam. But I think that there would be hell to pay if the college board um, came out and put like a Cold War DBQ or something like that. Now, you never want to put all of your eggs in that basket. But I have said before, and I'll say it again, I don't anticipate, especially on that early paper pencil test, I don't anticipate that we're going to see um, a situation where they put a mid to late 20th century DBQ out there because I think that they would get a lot of blood back from that. All right. So when something with a DBQ asked to what extent, okay? So to what extent is basically like you either, my advice here is to either take a position mostly agree or mostly disagree. If you're going for full credit, mostly agree or mostly disagree or to a great extent to a smaller extent and then you give a counter argument as well now those are some things i'm going to be going into a little bit more in student support uh you know i gave you all a link for marco learning student support that's in the youtube description those of you who are in the crowdcast i'll go ahead and put that in here again that you can go to marco learning student support we're going to be doing more of the addressing more of those skill-based questions okay so that's something that we're going to uh, that we're going to see here. Now, um, the highlights of the Adams administration. OK, main thing about the Adams administration I'd go into and I've got that on the unit three cheat sheet on um, the Alien and Sedition Acts. OK, I would say here that you've got this kind of quasi war with France and Congress, which is controlled by the Federalists who are being challenged. Um, politically by the Jeffersonians, um, they want to, uh, you know, that that the Federalists, uh, they use this quasi-war as an excuse to ban the publication of things that are printed 
against the government, which is a direct violation of the First Amendment. OK, and so this is something that Jefferson and Madison respond with the Virginia and Kentucky resolution, saying that these this federal law is unconstitutional. Now, Jefferson says that that makes it null and void. Madison only says that this is something that the state should get together um, and protest against these things to interpose. Um, so as far as that uh, as far as that goes, that's the biggest highlight of the Adams administration um, is, you know, is the passage of the unconstitutional Alien and Sedition Acts. So what were the most significant social changes that happened during the American Revolution? Okay, so Mary, I think I've already answered this one. So when I went into the legacies of the American Revolution, I've already answered this uh, particular question. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, as far as that, uh, as that goes, uh, you know, we had today a Unit 3 focus, and next week we will We'll have a unit four focus. So everything from 1800, the election of Jefferson, to 1848, which is on one hand the Mexican session, and on the other hand, uh, you know, the Seneca Falls Convention. This is the era of um, the Jeffersonians, then the age of Jackson, antebellum reform, manifest destiny, and all of that. So I will be back next week at nine o'clock p.m. Eastern for some more uh, some more review focusing on unit four. Now, remember, we also have Marco Learning Student Support. Y'all want to look into some more information on that. Y'all received an email earlier that actually has that actually has a discount code. And let me make sure, let me just, uh, let me just put that in there, make sure that uh, I'm giving y'all the correct, uh, the correct discount code here. So that, uh, let's see, the discount code, let's see, student support email, just want to make sure there is a discount code here. And that discount code here is Richie 2021. You can save $30 by, you know, putting in the discount code Richie 2021 is the code if you want to save $30 on that course. So make sure um, that you go into, uh, you know, you go into that. So with that, uh, keep those things in mind. And again, I will be sending y'all some things about some bonus writing sessions that, uh, you know, be premium sessions with some more information there. So ladies and gentlemen, thank y'all. Uh, thank y'all so much. And we will, uh, you know, see you again next Monday, April 12th at 9 o'clock p.m. Eastern to focus on Unit 4, 1800 to 1848. It is always a pleasure.